Everyone, hi. Bruce Moffson, LCSW, coming at you again from Sunridge, Nevada. As I said on the previous one, previous video we just did, it was called Coda the Friend. What was interesting is that we're doing tonight something a little different. So the second song that we're going to be doing, we're doing three songs back to back to back. We're doing Coda the Friend, we are going to do Mac DeMarco, and then we're going to do Capital Steez. What I want someone to do, I'm going to contest is for someone to win by letting us know what is the one thing all three of these artists have in common. We're going to release a song each week, a video each week. You'll have several weeks to do it. We'll take all the winners, then we will just, you know, pick, you know, one winner out of a hat, so to speak. And the person that wins will get a 30-minute video session with me to talk about anything. So again, doing three songs tonight, back to back to back. But all three of these artists have one thing in common. Let us know what it is. We'll pick the winner. And that winner gets a chance to talk with me. Fine. Okay, here we go. The song, the artist I'm doing, not the song, this artist I'm doing is Mac DeMarco. And again, got to thank my producer slash agent slash everything. Another great choice. Because the name of the song is, I'm looking at it again, Moonlight on the River. And I'm going to break down the lyrics. This song is interesting to me because in this song, Mac talks about the dad who abandoned him and his mom because he had been an addict, an, adult, an addict and an alcoholic. He's not sure how we should feel about him, Mac, about his father. He's lived most of his life without this man, but he's still an important part of him. And the song really kind of talks about that. I'm going to talk about the song... And I want to talk about some things about his life that I thought were interesting. And then I want to talk about a comment that he made in an article from The Guardian talking about that relationship issue and then tie it all together. So here we go. Moonlight on the River from the album This Old Dog. It's a 12th song. It goes, I'd say see you later if I thought I'd see you later. And just going off the top from this to the very beginning, the guitar, he's an excellent guitar player. It paints the picture very, very well. The way he hits the chords, and the last half of the song is basically an instrumental. But the 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 the, ver the lyrics and the way that the guitar, the sounds, really, really put very, very well together. And you get a sense of ache and loss, and it's done beautifully, very melancholy. So... I'd say see you later. And when you guys know what I always do is I just take specific lyrics from the song and I break it down. This is not a long song, but there are just certain lyrics that leap out that those ones I'm going to be breaking down and exploring. I'd say see you later if I thought I'd see you later. And I'd tell you that I loved you if I did. Those two lines, what I'm getting from them is pain, longing, frustration, anger, grief, sadness, stress, anxiety, embarrassment, and shame. All of these things swirling around. I'd say see you later if I thought I'd see you later, and I'd tell you that I loved you if I did. If, you know, if I see you. It's so strange, the next two lines, it's so strange deciding how to feel about it it's such a strange emotion standing there beside it. So from the first line, how to feel about it, you as the adult child now, but at one point being a kid, you're put between a rock and a hard place. How are you supposed to view your father? How are you supposed to relate to him? And it's such a strange emotion standing there beside it. What is it? The relationship. How do you define it? How do you quantify it? How do you explain it? How do you justify it in your head? Like, this is it. This is our relationship when it's not a relationship. And how do I define this relationship? Then it goes, I'd say see you next time if I thought there was a next time. Easy conversation ain't exactly where we're at. It's so strange deciding how I feel about you. It ain't like I used. I ain't used to going on without you. You know, if I thought there was a next time, first line, because people die and pass away, they move on. How do you even begin a conversation about no relationship? Where do you, where, where's your parameters? Where do you go from? Where do you start? Where do you begin? 
Hey, Dad, remember the time I fell off the roof and broke my arm? Hey, Dad, remember the time you taught me if, what, if, how to throw a fastball and you came to my high school game? Hey, Dad, remember teaching me how to drive? I almost hit the car on the end of the block. Hey, Dad, hey, Dad, hey, Dad, hey, Dad, hey, Dad, hey, Dad. Remember I got really upset when my girlfriend dumped me and I felt like a loser and you just put your arm around me and you took a walk with me? Hey, Dad, hey, Dad, hey, Dad, hey, Dad. When uh, my best friend died and you were there to come for me? There's no parameters. There's nothing to work from. In a sense, is this my legacy? This is my relationship with my father, an Ofer? No relationship? This is what it's going to be? If I have children of my own? Hey, Dad, what was Grandpa like? Uh, don't really know. Had some problems. You know, and what he's saying is, you know, in a question mark, like, it's my legacy because I have, I have had to move on no matter how I feel. I've had to move on. And ain't like I ain't used to going on without you. At a certain point, you got to put, you know, you got to put the key in the ignition. You got to put it into drive. You have to move on. I got to be honest. I didn't have a great relationship with my father. And I could, you know, self-pity and be angry and be frustrated. I got to give this guy credit how he's handled that situation in a public eye to a certain extent and how mature he comes across as. It's not easy. Trust me, it's not easy. And I, I couldn't have done it as well as he has at, at even at his age. But you have to move on. You can't wallow in that. Like, uh, therefore, I, am, I have the right to do this or I have the right to do that. I have the right to be dysfunctional. You're cheating yourself and you're cheating those around you that depend upon you. And the chorus, I'm home with moonlight on the river saying my goodbyes. I'm home, there's moonlight on the river, everybody dies. And the way he draws it out with the chorus, it makes it more powerful. It really, really does. Now, I want to talk about him as well because I watched, you know, multiple interviews of him talking and, you know, explaining everything. And there was a comment made that when you what he's doing is he's taking you into I my thought was he's taking you into a state of mind when he's talking about his father it's discordant it's unclear it's confusing the music is clashing that last third that last half of the of the song and the relationship between a son and a father that's not at peace there was a comment made by lilac's music the ending of the song is that is the most grim thing I've heard in a long time. It's like Max Darkside suddenly peeks through this happy and goofy personality. Yeah, the music is soothing to that point, and then boom, it just takes you to a different level. You, you're peeking behind the curtain at someone's real essence. And it takes a lot of guts to do that in general, even in therapy. It's even harder to do that in public. I watch an interview with him by a, J a Jake Zeem, and it's called How a Goofball Became the Prince of Indie Rock. And I learned some things about him from all the interviews as well, but I really like this interview. And it goes, he has his own label. Anything that he puts out, that's on his label, and he self-produces and self-records everything. He's a self-made man. He really understands how to market himself now, unlike a lot of other artists that are still floundering and not sure how to go forward. He started putting stuff together on Bandcamp where you could sell your stuff online because like everyone else, he realizes Spotify and iTunes control the market for live music today. And the royalties of, like, I think it's like a quarter of a cent or a penny per play. Now, he's had some songs that have hit like tens of millions of dollars. So he's one of the few people that have made money from recording music. But he understands how do you engage an audience? How do you talk to people? He does it very, very well. He started putting stuff online. He's clearly comfortable on social media because he does a lot of jokes. He pokes fun at himself. He was showing pictures of him with a double chin, um, with him all kinds of funny costumes, acting funny, acting weird. He says, I, I, you know, this is who I am. No need to kind of like have this label of Mr. Rockstar, Mr. Rapper. You can't you know who the real person is. Um no end at all, be all whatever. He just is happy where things are at. No end, you know, be all whatever. He's good with that. Whatever will happen will happen. Sense of self and self-confidence comes out of this guy. You know, I know who I am. I know what my situation is. And what he's telling us, I believe, through his music is be yourself. 
in all times, good and bad. Just be who you are. Don't be like a phony. You know, as he says, uh, not end all, be all, and whatever happens will happen. But go with the flow, but be yourself when you do it. It's a good point because a lot of times when you see people under stress is when you really get a real glimpse of what kind of person they really are. Are they calm? Are they low key? They start screaming and getting loud and profanity. It's a great understanding of what they really are, what the true personality is. There was a scene with his father in this video where he meets him outside a venue, and it was tough. You know, he's trying to connect. He's trying to talk to him. Are you going to come by and see me? I'm going to be playing another place uh, tomorrow, talking. The dad never got out of the car. You know, he stayed in the car the whole time. And he's with another guy, and they're talking. You could feel it was painful to watch for me as a clinician. You know, I thought maybe get out of the car and hug the kid. I love you. You're my, you're, I'm so proud of you. It was just light conversation like you'd have with a friend, with someone you met on the road. But where was the warmth? It's pro Look, the guy has problems. I got to give the guy guts, though, for putting that, letting, that in, letting that piece be in the interview. It's a tough thing to watch from a clinical perspective. And I get it. Everyone wants to be acknowledged by their parents. I get it. Whether you're a girl or a boy, it's really, really important. And understand the relationship. It is what it is. When you accept it, you can move on better. It's hard to swallow. It's not an easy thing to do. When you understand the limitations of a relationship, you move on. And you, and you, you don't heal. You don't like feel good about yourself. But you can move on. You get off the table. You get off the chair. You know. You get off the rug. You gotta move on. You don't. You don't want to let these things rip you up and destroy you inside emotionally. Now, there's a point here also in this article from the Guardian. I want to explain this from a clinical level. And he he did a song called "My Old Man," and Demarco sings by coming like his father, and it goes, "Uh oh." Looks like I'm seeing more of my old man in me. A relatable enough sentiment made more touching by the knowledge his dad's an alcoholic and an addict who he hardly knows. And he was brought up, he's, you know, obviously everyone knows he grew up in Canada, brought up by his mom, who changed his surname after the dad refused to pay child support. And he, he says, I'm not, I've been trying to not turn into him. That's the last thing I'd like to do since I was a young kid, he says. But it's funny when you look and you go, oh, look, you do like drinking a lot now, too, huh? Okay, okay, so it's uh, interesting. In the song he sings, look how old and cold and tired and lonely he's become. There's a price tag hanging off of having all that fun. Yeah. When you only think about yourself, you're not thinking about other people, and it's party, 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 only good times, it takes a toll. When you're only thinking about yourself, not thinking about other people, it does take a toll on you because there's a price to pay for everything. Now, this album was written months ago when the dad would become very ill. And the last song goes, the thought of him no longer being around, well, sure, it would be sad, but not really different. And even though we barely know each other, it still hurts watching him fade away. Although his father's health has now improved, the two are still not in touch. And he goes like this, did exploring these issues on the album change the way he views his father? Um, no, I mean, I was trying to understand it, but I don't know. I really don't. It just solidified the fact that I don't understand. So true. When I do counseling, and I've done this hundreds if not thousands of times, you're in the room, you're doing the assessment. You got the kid, you got the single mom, right? You always come to that question in the assessment, where is the father, and if he's not here, is he involved? My line of work, a cloudy look will come over the eyes of the kid. It could be a boy or a girl, it's irrelevant. White, black, brown, yellow, doesn't matter. And the woman will look away embarrassed and have a hard time meeting my eyes. And you get that very stilted answer that makes no sense to those two questions. 
but it tries to justify all the pain and anger that comes with that from both people in the room. Because the mom is embarrassed, the mom is angry, the mom is pissed off, the mom is bitter, humiliated. Because I've heard every answer. Oh, he has another family. He lives in a different state. He never calls. He calls every nine months. My kid is miserable. My kid begs to spend time with him. He breaks promises all the time. We live in the same city. I call. He promises he doesn't pick up. He doesn't come. He's three weeks late. The check is always late. And the kid has to hear this sometimes. And sometimes I'll say to the kid, do you mind stepping out of the room? Because I want to talk about something private with your mom. The kid knows where it's going to be. He's not stupid. And when he said that, I don't understand. Neither one of them do. And I get it because I've been in that situation. I'm a father. My kids are now old, thank God, getting older. But I, I couldn't ever imagine not being a part of their lives, for good or for bad, because not everything in life is always perfect. But I got to be in the game. I got to be a soldier. I got to look out for them till I'm really physically able to undo it. They're my kids. I could never imagine a moment where someone said, hey, where's your father? He's not around. He's distant. And I got it. I got the pain. And in the interview, he was it was he was like on a, he was doing some songs and like a like a small like a little venue like maybe thirty people. And I guess the promoter is like not the promoter the DJ is talking to him. He's like, "How do you handle it? How do you handle it?" He goes, "Well, you know, I'm not going to denigrate the guy. I'm not going to humiliate the guy. I'm not going to savage the guy." I'm paraphrasing what he said. He's still my father. I wish him the best. But boy, you could just see what he'd like to get from his dad. What's missing? Guy's a great artist, huge following, very talented person, very savvy with the business. I didn't really pick on on that till I really got to understand his music and listened to him a lot. Very, very low key, unassuming, calm, gets it. But there's still that hole here that's missing. All I'm saying, guys, you got kids out there, if you're listening tonight, pick up the phone. Don't just text, pick up the phone. Make a visit. Spend time. You don't realize what you're doing to help your kid by doing that. That will decrease so many problems now and for the future, academically, socially, sexually, behaviorally. And how they're going to do in the future is what you put into them now is what you're going to get later. Uh, when people comment on this, let me know how this thing resonates with you. If you had that kind of experience, I'm kind of curious. And um, let us know. I know it's a tough topic to talk about, but you know we don't shy away from that. Thanks for watching. Bruce Mopson, Sunridge, Nevada.